You can turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. I'm going to talk to you today about how to be a good, stubborn Christian. A lot of people think that stubbornness is a bad trait, and I guess it would be in some areas, but uh, when it comes to being a Christian, stubbornness is something that you should have. Let me show you that today. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58 says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You know, if you're somebody that backs off all the time and somebody that compromises and whatever, you're not going to really know for sure that your labor is not going to be in vain. Okay, you're always going to be wishy-washy, double-minded, you know, like the Bible warns about. So what are you supposed to be? Well, according to our text here, it's, you're supposed to be steadfast and unmovable. All right? Uh, what is that? Stubborn. Many people would call you stubborn. Oh, you're not willing to give up the King James Bible. No. You're not willing to give up your belief in the rapture being before the time of Jacob's trouble. No. You're not willing to say that uh, Catholicism is actually okay or something. No, I'm not going to say that's okay because it's satanic. You know, I'm stubborn in those areas. You're not going to move me one inch. You know, I was just talking to a lost guy the other day and uh, he was, you know, trying to talk to me, oh, I think it all roads lead to heaven and stuff. You know what? It doesn't matter if you're Catholic or Jewish or Protestant or whatever else and it doesn't really matter. And, and he's like, I'm not trying to talk you out of your beliefs or anything. And, and I was just, I just kind of said, yeah, I'm not worried about that. And he said, I guess I probably couldn't move you from your beliefs, could you? Or could I? And I said, no. I know what I believe. I know the Bible, what the Bible teaches. You're not going to move me. I'm going to be steadfast, unmovable. Let's go to the next scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to see over and over again that a Christian is told to be unmovable. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. It says here, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at, at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Very true. If you are a Christian, if you are doing right and living and upholding the King James Bible, you will suffer persecution from friends, from family, from people out in the world, whatever. You will suffer persecution. And it's kind of funny because I hear this thing, you know, a lot of these uh, post-trib Christians will say, um, you know, Christians in America have had it so easy, they don't know what persecution is about. Uh, well, in some ways I can understand that, uh, you know, Christians aren't being put in prison and stuff like that. But I'll, I'll tell you what, uh, I know a lot of real Bible believers out there that have experienced very high degrees of persecution from family and from you know, professing friends and things like that. Yeah, I've seen that. I've experienced some of it myself. But uh, let's continue here. Verse 13, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. That's very important. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. You know, it's very, very instructive right there. Verse 15, or excuse me, 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. What is that? Stubborn. Continue in those things that you've learned. But look at the last part of the verse. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. You know why people back away on doctrine? Because they were taught by men and not by the Lord. They put some preacher up on a pedestal, you know, literally in the Babel buildings. He's up on the raised platform there, his pulpit. They put him up there and, and don't dare question brother so-and-so. You know, brother so-and-so, he's our man of God, you know, and everything. 
And then later on they leave Brother So-and-So's little cult building there and they go off to another one and they go, oh, I guess I was wrong in this and this and that and whatever else. And I guess I need to change. And then they go to some other place and they hear some other preaching or teaching or whatever. Oh, I guess I better change again. I'm not saying if you're genuinely wrong, you know, that you shouldn't change. But what I'm saying is so many people are falling away, falling away from stands that they once took. Why? Because it was men that told them. They were taught by men. You see, the stands that I take where the Lord has showed me things, it's scripture after scripture after scripture. Scripture, life experiences, seeing it, how it works out, practical application and things like that, uh, you're not going to budge me. You know why? Because the Lord showed it to me. I know who taught me. There are things I've been taught by men. Uh, there's some great teachers out there. Uh, uh, Ken Hoven, I learned a lot from him. Uh, Peter Ruckman, Sam Gipp. Um, David Daniels, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of great men out there that I've learned from, but some of the things that they've taught me, I haven't had time to verify or whatever. The Lord hasn't showed me it from Scripture necessarily. I'm not saying right or wrong one way or the other, but the point is there are certain things that I've been taught by some of those men, and I'm willing to change. Why? Well, the Lord hasn't showed me the exact same thing there. Um, you know, I'm just trying to think of, of a good example here. Um, you know, uh, the thing of, of going to a church, a local church, find a good local church in your area. I, I used to believe that way. Why? I was taught by men. But when the Lord started to show me from Scripture that there's no such thing as a local church in Scripture, uh, the concept of it, you know, they say, well, yes, but the, the people meeting in localities, those are local churches. And you say, okay, then it's a uh, this local church thing that you're talking about is people meeting in a certain locality. Well, no, it's a building. See, no, it's a problem. And they'll try to duck that and they'll say, well, yes, it's people meeting in localities inside of a building. And that's the local church. And I can guarantee you that there's not one Baptist, independent, fundamental Baptist building out there that they say the church is the people and we don't call this place church. There's not one of them that do that, okay? So don't don't kid me, all right? But you see, I used to be very, very hardcore about the thing of go to church every time the doors are open. Why? I was taught by men. But when the Lord showed me what the Bible actually teaches, that it's the people, not the building, and this, this whole, you know, church building structure thing, there's all the politics that go along with it, all the problems that go along with it. The Lord showed me, that's a stand I take now. I am no longer for church buildings. I'm very much opposed to them, and I will never enter into another one as long as I live. All right? Why? The Lord showed me. He taught me. And the men that once taught me, they were wrong. So I'm not going to continue in those things that were wrong. I'm going to continue in the things that the Lord has showed me. And I'm not going to back down. I'm going to be stubborn. You get it? Ephesians chapter 6. Turn next to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Got a little bit of a headache right now, so I'm sorry if I'm a little bit spaced out here. Uh, trying to focus. Uh, but uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and on, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly 
to make known the mystery of the gospel for which all for excuse me for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Notice over there in verses 13 and 14 you have you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand stand therefore. Three times you're told to stand. Okay? And up in uh, verse 11, it says, you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So right there in that passage, there are four times you're told to stand. You're told, stand your ground. So um, what would some people perceive that to be? They'd say you're stubborn. Well, oh, you're just so stubborn, you won't give up your beliefs, these crazy beliefs of yours and everything else. Have you been through that? I know a lot of you have. I've heard from you. I've heard how family members have turned against you. Contacted recently by a, a friends of the ministry here, and, and um, they told us how that uh, they have grandchildren that they're not even allowed to see anymore. Why? Because they take stands. The grandparents do. And the children don't like it. So they say, we don't even want you around our, our children, our, you know, your grandchildren anymore. Mm -hmm. because they take stands. It'll cost you something, but you better be willing to do it. Philippians, the book of Philippians, chapter 1, verse 27 through 30. It says here, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in the, name, in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me, and now here to be in me. Okay? Uh, again, we see it there. Stand fast, that ye stand fast. But notice it says, in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. How is it possible to stand together in one spirit with one mind when you have different Bible versions that contradict one another? You see, they try to say, many of these wicked people out there, they'll try to say that King James onlyism is a cult. Uh, nothing could be farther from the truth. We have the same standard. And there's plenty of variation between those who hold to the King James Bible. We are not a cult. Okay, What you have with all of the different versions, you have multiple scriptures that are not even possible. And right there is one of them. Verse 27, Philippians 1, 27, is not possible with a congregation of people that use multiple different versions. It's not possible. You can't be in the same spirit, in the same mind. It's not possible. Okay, you're going to have all these different versions that contradict one another. But um, what is the thought be behind standing fast? Well, I said this thing years and years ago in a sermon. I don't even remember which one it was. But the idea of standing fast would be kind of like you're in the military and um, your commanding officer comes over and he says, Okay, soldier, come here. I want you to stand fast right here. Don't move. And you say, I'm not allowed to move. He says, okay, okay, let me just do it this way. Take your boots off. You take your boots off and that commanding officer takes nails and he hammers those boots right into the boards of that building you're supposed to guard. And he says, get in those boots and tie them up. I'll be back in an hour. I want to see you in those boots. What are you doing? You're standing fast. You're not moving. That's what you're supposed to do as a Christian. And by the way, it's interesting there, the next verse, 28, And in nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. Uh, when it comes to people making fun of you and things like that, I mean, yeah, it's going to hurt. Yeah, it's, it's rough sometimes. But I'll tell you what, brethren, you're right and they're wrong. And so when they start to call you stubborn and, oh, you're just old-fashioned and whatever else, okay, don't be terrified by your adversaries. doesn't matter who they are, brother, sister, 
husband, wife, mother, father, best friend, whatever else, co-workers, don't be terrified by their little accusations against you. All right. I'm going to show you why as we continue in this study. Next, go to uh, chapter 4 in Philippians here. Philippians chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. It says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Eudeus and, I, and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with other my fellow laborers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Good advice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. Those things which ye have heard, both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. Did you know that it's actually a peaceful thing to be stubborn in terms of Scripture? It is. It truly is. And, you know, like I, I talked about in a previous video there, this whole thing of 923, Jesus is going to come back, the rapture is going to happen, all this other stuff, all the signs are lining up, and, you know, you don't know that. Nobody knows that. Nobody knows when the Lord's going to make the rapture happen and the body of Christ is going to leave. We have no idea. We really don't. Uh, you say, well, then how am I supposed to have peace? Oh, by uh, verse 8 there, you know, Actually, if you want to go up to verse 4, rejoice in the Lord. Verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. Number 6, be careful for nothing. Don't worry about it. Um, but you're to pray with supplication and thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And you'll have the peace of God as a result. I mean, that's the solution to this whole thing. You know, and, and when you say, I'm going to take stands because the Lord showed me this stuff, I've seen it, I've been taught it, but the Lord's also showed it to me in His Word, and I'm convinced that it's true. Okay, then don't back down on that. Don't change. That's how you're going to have peace. Okay? Next, we're going to go to Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. It says here, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and them in Hierapolis. Interesting, because when John writes to the church in Laodicea, they're not doing very good. Uh, they're definitely not standing. <laughs> they're compromising. So this guy had a great burden here. Um, Epaphras, you know, had a great burden for them that are in Laodicea. Well, if you're sa saved right now and a, and a Bible-believing Christian, I'm sure that there are some uh, Laodicean-type Christians that are neither hot nor cold. They're lukewarm. Uh, they're increased with goods and everything else. I'm um, sure that there's some of those that you know that you have a burden for. Just found that interesting. But you're to stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Again, how can you fulfill the will of God when you're conforming to the world? When you're not, you're, you're constantly changing, your standards are constantly changing. The Bible says that we're to not be conformed to the world, according to Romans chapter 12. Really something to think about. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 verses 6 through 10. 
says here, But now, when Timotheus came from you unto us, and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity, and that ye have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us, as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our afflictions, affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live, if ye stand fast in the Lord. Um, for what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Um, very interesting there. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. I'll tell you, it's very, very distressing to me when I see people that, that once were convinced of the truth uh, through this ministry here, and they later come back and they say, I no longer believe this way anymore. It's always just like, you know, and I don't, I don't feel like, well, I failed. I haven't been able to answer. No, I feel like, well, you know, I've given them enough information, and if they've gone off, well, they've been listening to a false prophet. There's nothing I can do about that. I can't, uh, I can't control people's lives. It's got to be between them and the Lord. Um, but I'll tell you, it's really exciting to hear people that have, um, you know, stuck by the truth for years and years and years. And they don't look to me as their final authority. They, they look to the book. Uh, that's what I like to see. Next, let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <coughs> 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 says here, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. <coughs> Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast. And hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistles. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Okay. Uh, again, you see the thing of peace coming through standing there. Standing fast and not backing down. Don't compromise. All right so very very important and if you are constantly changing your positions you know I said to a sister the one time she wrote me and she said what about this what about that and I said I'm not a flip-flop preacher and you know I was saying tell my wife about that she kind of went what you know what do you mean flip-flop preacher I said well flipping this way and then flopping that way and then flipping this way and oh okay I guess I you know I'll believe in eternal security now I don't believe in eternal security now I believe in it again now you know I take my stands. Right or wrong, people can disagree with me if they like to. I take my stands. And I stay by those stands. I do not arrive at my sermons lightly. I don't just say, you know, I'm just going to sit down here. I've got five minutes and write out a couple scriptures and whatever else. There are sermons that it's taken me months, uh, sometimes even years to put things together. Um, just wrestling with uh, different subjects and, and what, Lord, you know, what do you want me to say about this or whatever else. Um, if I'm wrong and the Lord convicts me, then I, yeah, I'll change. Absolutely. But uh, I hold on to the things that the Lord has showed me. I'm not going to be quick to, uh, to back down on those issues. But there's another stand that we, look, that we need to look at. This is the one that you really need to keep in mind, especially if you're a young Christian and you're getting kicked around by family members and other people and stuff like that. This is one that's very important. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15. This, this is another type of standing that uh, you won't be doing as a Christian, but uh, other people will be. You need to keep this in mind. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. 
and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Hmm. So the last stand that is taken is actually going to be the wicked standing before God. Hmm. And uh, it's interesting because they try to accuse you of being stubborn. But uh, in the end, they're going to be the ones that are guilty of true sinful stubbornness. Why? They were stubborn in their self-righteousness. They didn't want to come to God as sinners. So, you know, for salvation. So, therefore, the Lord just simply says, Okay, you took your stand. Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And away they go. So, when you say, I believe that the King James Bible is God's pure, perfect word for the English-speaking world. You can be mocked, you can be made fun of, and whatever else, people laugh at you for that. But at the Great White Throne Judgment, they're going to agree with you. They'll know the truth. You say, I believe that uh, Jesus Christ is the only way to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. People are going to mock you. They're going to laugh at you. Oh, you're one of those little goody two-shoes. Oh, a little Christian. Eh. They'll stand before God someday. If they don't take their stands like you do here on the earth, they'll take them before the, the uh, great white throne judgment, before they're cast into the lake of fire for all of eternity. So keep that in mind. When you have learned something and been assured of it, the Lord is, has borne witness and, and just like, yeah, that's, that's it right there. Don't back down. Because you see, if it is truth from God, if it is something that the Lord has showed you, you're never going to have to back down on that thing. And anybody that denies it is one day going to see it as the truth. Everybody at some point in time, at you know, in eternity, everybody's going to believe in God and understand that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. Everyone. Total 100% of all people alive today are one day going to believe that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. A lot of them, most of them, it's going to be too late. They're going to live their life, they're going to reject Jesus Christ, and they're going to go to hell for eternity. But they'll understand that Jesus was the only way to heaven. So, make sure you're taking the right stands, and when you take those stands, be stubborn and don't back down. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your, this uh, challenge from your word. I pray, Lord, that the, the, the Bible-believing Christians out there would be stubborn. And when they learn something, Lord, when you show it to them, I pray that they would take their stand on that issue and then not back down. And um, I do pray for that, Lord. And I pray if there's anyone out there who does not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, I pray that they would get that fixed up today. Uh, that they would realize that now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. That they wouldn't uh, procrastinate any longer. And uh, I just ask, Lord, that you would please just uh, protect your people from the false prophets out there. And uh, I just pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's going to be it for this study. Kind of a short little one um, and uh, so a lot of other projects coming up here not going to get into a lot of that but uh, just real busy around here and um, so we will keep bringing out some videos so just uh, please keep us in your prayers we always appreciate that uh, thank you to everybody that uh, donates to the ministry again we appreciate that and um, just stand strong brethren it's uh you know, as things get worse and worse and worse, um, it's going to be more important to take our stands and not back down. Okay, uh, don't worry about what man says about you. Uh, even if they're friends and family and loved ones and whatever else, don't worry about it. They're going to stand before God someday and have to give an account for their lives. Uh, I know a lot of you are younger out there. A lot of people write to us that are very young in their early teens. And you talk about how that your friends and family members, you know, really make fun of you, really put you down. 
Um, I understand. I understand that that hurts. I'm not going to tell you, well, just tough it out. You can get through it and whatever. It, it hurts when it's family and friends. Uh, but uh, they will stand before God someday and they will answer. Keep that in mind. Okay? So that will be it. Thank you very much for watching.